This is Judith Lay welcoming you to Manx Radio and to the podcast of this week's edition of At Your Service. Manx Radio. The church and mental health, the island's unique role in marking a very important anniversary and new music from a very unexpected source. It's all here for you on today's programme. So let's begin with the anniversary. Highland Laddie, a Scottish folk tune, and at one time, all British Army Highland regiments were required to use Highland Laddie as their regimental march. That all changed in 2006 with the establishment of the Royal Regiment of Scotland and the adoption of a new regimental march, Scotland the Brave. But in 1944, it's Highland Laddie that would have been in use. And so that's the tune that's being used as pipers around the British Isles prepare to mark the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings on Thursday, June the 6th. The largest seaborne invasion in history and the operation which began the liberation of France and the rest of Western Europe and laid the foundations of the Allied victory on the Western Front. Unprecedented coordination between Allied nations and intensive planning led to a force from 13 countries approaching Normandy in a 5,000-vessel armada. In the early hours of D-Day, 24,000 paratroopers and glider-borne troops landed behind German lines to provide tactical support. Then a ground force of more than 130,000 troops came ashore on five beaches across a 50-mile stretch of Normandy coast. By the end of D-Day, there had been 10,000 Allied casualties. But this was only the beginning. The ensuing Battle of Normandy was to last into August and cost tens of thousands of lives. It paved the way for the liberation of much of Northwest Europe. This coming Thursday is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And for the last 80 days, each morning at 8am, a lone piper somewhere in the British Isles has played Highland Laddie, a poignant reminder of all that was lost in order to gain our freedom. This act of commemoration has been worked out to cover the British Isles, reflecting the fact that the British Isles as a whole played their part in the Normandy landings. And the final ten days have been entrusted to our own Ellen Vanin pipes and drums. Pipe major Alistair Lothian began the ten-day countdown on Manx soil by playing in Laxey. And since then, each morning, pipers have been taking it in turns to play in different places around the island. They've been on Douglas Head, in Port Sodrick, in Ramsey, and earlier this morning, the piper played in Peel Castle. Tomorrow, they'll be on Onken Head. I think that will be at the Ian Hislop Memorial. On Tuesday at the Cenotaph on Douglas Promenade. On Wednesday the Piper will play at the War Graves at Jerby Parish Church. And finally, on the anniversary itself, Thursday, June the 6th, the Piper will play at 8am at the National War Memorial in St John's. The members of Ellen Vanin Pipes and Drums would be very pleased if you could join them for all or any of these mornings. A time for us to pause and reflect as they pipe the island towards the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings. Now for a complete contrast. A community of nuns who normally live a life of quiet prayer have just released their second collection of beautiful, peaceful music. They describe themselves as a community of sisters who share prayer, 
work, laughter and struggles and live according to the form of life drawn up by St. Clare of Assisi in 1253. Communities of Poor Clare nuns exist all around the world, but this is a community in Arundel in West Sussex, and they've a small shop where they sell cards, books and items that they've made themselves, and they have a small guest house as part of the convent too. They live very simply, not entirely without contact with the outside world, but they just don't go out very often, but they're very aware that they're regarded as objects of curiosity but to them, they are simply women who have each given their life to God. When Decker Records approached them, saying that they'd heard that they had a nice choir and asking them to record some music that had been arranged by James Morgan and Juliet Pochin, the nuns were very reluctant and only agreed after a lot of prayer and discussion within the community. And when they did eventually agree to make the recording, one of their first conditions was that all the recordings had to be done in their convent and only at the time when they would normally have had their choir practice. In other words, making the CD had to fit in with their normal community life. The first CD, released at the end of 2020, was an instant success. And their latest collection is, I think, set for the same or maybe even greater success. One of the things they now most enjoy is giving away the royalties from their music to local charities, food banks, schools and a women's refuge, and are touched by the many people who write to say how much they enjoy their music. Someone wrote to them and said, I don't believe in God, I still don't believe in God, but your music has touched something in me that I've never experienced before. As one of the sisters said, that is wonderful. Even if a person uses our music purely for therapy, who's to put the line where God is at work and where he isn't? The Poor Clare Community of Arundel and I Will Heal You. And there'll be another track from their album, 
My Peace I Give You, a little bit later in the programme. But now it's time to welcome my special guest, a recent visitor to the island whose voice may be familiar to you if you listen to the daily service on BBC Radio 4 Extra, where she's a regular contributor. She is Reverend Dr Isabel Hamley, an Anglican priest who's the principal of Ridley Hall, a theological training college in Cambridge. Yeah, thank you. So I'm principal of Ridley Hall in Cambridge, which is a college when we train people for ministry in the Church of England and actually in other churches as well. Youth workers as well as vicars and lots of different things. Really? Now, that's a key point because ecumenical training is becoming more popular now, isn't it? The value of it is being appreciated. Yes, it's it's really important. Certainly in Cambridge, we've got something called the Cambridge Theological Federation. So different denominations, actually, we train our people together. So they have a place of belonging in their own tradition, a college where they're rooted. But a lot of the teaching happens across denominations. And I think that's really, really powerful because we live in a world where people are increasingly retreating in their own echo chambers, aren't they? And listening to the people that are like them. And I think training people consciously getting them to spend time with those who are different coming across things that may not always be comfortable is actually really helpful. And really is genuinely equipping them for what they're going to meet in ministry because you want these people to go out and embrace everything and everybody that that, that they meet. Yes, you certainly do. I mean, some of my fondest memories of being a parish priest in Nottingham, we had a group of ministers of all denominations and we met to pray together and we did stuff together around Easter and we talked about the challenges of ministry. We thought about projects we could do together. There was something so precious about that. And none of us were out there to kind of defend our own territory, if you know what I mean. So if somebody came to our church and to explore, but I thought actually our church isn't really the right place for you, but you'd be much happier either with the Catholics or at the Pentecostal. Well, that's fine. I just had a chat to my friend who was the Pentecostal minister and, you know, and there was something really, I think, really beautiful about that and and really good for the contemporary world. That is so lovely. If that was the only thing you ever said in this interview this morning, that would be really so inspirational. Now, you have the most beautiful accent, which I suspect goes beyond the British Isles. Tell me a little bit about yourself, please, Isabel. Oh, I do have an accent. I'm French, so I grew up in central France, the kind of flat, boring bit. You go past on your way to somewhere interesting, um, so nobody knows the place I come from. But uh, I grew up there and um, I started going to church in my teens. I don't come from a, um, a religious family. I come from a very anti-religious family, you know, the stereotypical French secular family. But I moved to England to do a master's at the University of Nottingham, having said I will never marry an Englishman. And of course, uh, I met my husband and never left. But how interesting that you grew up in in what you describe as a a stereotypical secular family, you know. So can you think back to was it was it somebody you met or somewhere you went that, that touched you deeply? Yes, I mean, there's, there's two things. I grew up, you know, in a difficult environment at home. And so even though we were very secular and you didn't talk about God, I always prayed. I don't know why. I couldn't explain it. There was just always for me that sense of praying was important. And then when I went to secondary school, I started walking to school and along the same road, another girl walked and her dad had started a little Baptist church just down the road. And uh, she gave me a Bible. And as I read the New Testament, I just felt this is a God I've been praying to my entire life. And, and that's really the start of my kind of more official faith journey. So, coincidence or a God incidence that teenager Isabel should meet another student who, through the gift of a Bible, made sense of all those years of prayers to a God that Isabel had never met. Let's return now to my conversation with Reverend Dr. Isabel Hamley, who's principal of Ridley Hall, a theological training college in Cambridge, but who also has a real concern about the response the church should be making to people of all ages with mental health issues. Mental health is something that is a a massive concern Mm. to everybody. And that's something that is very much on your heart, isn't it? Yes, so I've been interested in kind of mental health and the connection between mental health and spirituality for a very long time, partly because when I was a teenager, I had an eating disorder. And so mental health has been something that I've struggled with for myself. But I've also met lots of people who've struggled with their mental health and and for whom the question of 
what do I do with that as a, as a person of faith? How do I understand it? Can faith help my mental health? Can faith make it worse at times? And those questions have been there for me. So I've worked with people one by one in pastoral settings, but I've also done some work with a mental health charity called Sanctuary Mental Health, who are brilliant. They offer free training for churches on how to be good places for those who struggle. And, and I've done some kind of more academic work and written books with others on mental health. That training is, is key because it's no use saying, come to our church, we, we welcome everybody. And then not knowing how to, yeah. to respond helpfully and, and, and lovingly to, to those people. Yeah, that's right. And I think people, I mean, there's two mistakes you can make. One is to be unaware of quite how little you know and therefore try to do things and getting it wrong. And the other is being so afraid of not doing enough that you do nothing. And actually, there's a, there's a good space in between those extremes for churches where we, we have to understand what it is we can do and what it is we can't do. When do we need to refer people on? Be clear about having... Others we might work in partnership with or that we can send people to. But at the same time, there are things we can do about loving people, about being careful about the things we say or don't say, about seeing a person who struggles with their mental health as a whole person, you know, rather than a diagnosis or a label. I think that's really important. There's something really powerful about loving somebody through whatever they're going through, you know, and being able to treat them as a member of our church, a member of our community, without putting pressure on them to get better, but simply walking with them kind of over the distance. And actually, there's not many places in the contemporary world where we do that, because a lot of communities kind of have fallen apart a little bit. If you're working and you're really struggling with your mental health, you may not be at work. And church is one of those places where we can, you know, not just say to somebody you're loved and you're lovable, but actually we can make it happen. And we have to acknowledge that sometimes churches have been a place where maybe over issues of sexuality, where people have not felt welcome or understood. And that can be a barrier for the people who, that we want to come to church. That can be a barrier we need to be able to acknowledge and, and overcome. Yeah, that's true. And there's lots of things, you know, stories about people who were told they had to be healed or that if they're struggling with their mental health, it's their own fault or, you know, there's, there's a whole range of things. And, and again, there is something about balance here where we have to be self-aware. We have to understand how we come across. We have to have kindness and compassion for every person. But we also have to be aware that none of us are perfect. And so how can we be communities of grace where, you know, we do our best, but we also are gracious with one another when we get it wrong, when we say the wrong thing, where we put our foot in it or, you know, where, where we just say something because we don't understand what the other person is getting through. And, and finding that balance, I think, can be a little bit tricky, but is really important because otherwise we can't have community. I don't think you can have relationships if you don't have grace and forgiveness. But grace and forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't challenge what's wrong either. So, you know, it's finding that way of saying, well, actually what you said there wasn't very helpful to me, but let's, let's learn together. Let's learn together. Now, the reason for your visit to the island was that you were a guest of the Island Spirituality Network and we're just having this conversation after you've spent a morning with them. What were you saying to them? What was the, what was the key message that you were giving this morning? So this morning we were looking at happiness in the Bible. Um, there's something really interesting with the fact that most of our translations of the Bible don't translate the word happiness as happy. They translate it as blessed or blessedness, even though there are words in Hebrew and Greek for that. So I started there and exploring, actually, what does happiness look like? And, um, and some of the stuff we looked at is the way in which happiness is about relationship and the health of the community, how you can only foster happiness when you look at the happiness of an entire community rather than just individuals. And also looking at um, concepts of happiness as rooted in our humanity. So what is an appropriate understanding of our humanity that can help us yearn and desire for the kind of thing that will truly make us happy rather than endlessly chasing after something that we can never have 
But the world teaches us that happiness is vested in things that we own and status and power and money and all the wrong things, isn't it? Yes, it does with the biblical picture. I love a lot of the biblical pictures are about, you know, having a house, having enough to eat, being able to have meaningful work and benefit from the work of your hands so that you have enough to eat and you can sit in your house with your family and with your friends. And I think that's a beautiful picture of happiness. You know, I... I told um, I told a story this morning of a friend of mine, Bishop Anthony Pogo. He's from South Sudan. He has known war, being a refugee. A lot of people in his diocese have been refugees. And I've asked him one, what does happiness, what does justice look like? And he said, for me, it would be sitting outside my house under a mango tree full of mangoes, knowing that my children are at school um, just down the lane. And I think that's such a beautiful picture because it's about safety, it's about justice, it's about having enough to eat, but something fairly simple. It's about harmony with creation. It's about nurturing the next generation. There's something really beautiful. And I think if all of us could have a version of happiness that was that rooted and grounded, the world would probably be a happier place. In the true sense of the word yes. happiness. So if somebody's listening to you now, Isabel, and they're saying, Yeah, I want to be I want to be that person, I want to be that church, how would you suggest that we took a next step? Hmm. I think happiness and um, kind of dealing well with mental health actually both start with being truthful. Um, it's not about saying, let's look at the bright side of life or sweep problems under the carpet. It's about saying, actually, life is often really rubbish. And it's OK to think that life is rubbish. And it's OK to be cross about life being difficult. And it's OK to be saying to God, actually, this isn't OK, <laughs> you know. But it's also about looking at the roots of what makes us unhappy. So, again, because otherwise we're just putting a plaster over the wound, you know, saying, what, what is it that would truly make us a better place? Um, and being honest about the things that are the barriers, whether they're in ourselves or whether they're in the world around us, and then journeying together towards that. I think happiness is often a journey. And, that, you know, I often wonder whether happiness is a bit like life in the song. You know, it's what happens when you're busy doing other things. And often you only realise that this was a happy time looking retrospectively um, and being able to nurture that ability to see the small moments of happiness and to make happiness part of the journey rather than the goal, I think, is really helpful. And just finally, would you like to see churches looking at themselves, a church as a, as, a, as a group of people looking at themselves and seeing how they, as a body of people, can, can learn to respond? Would you like to see churches improving what they know, basically. Yes, I mean, I want to acknowledge that some churches do an amazing job already, and that's wonderful, but all of us have things to learn. And, and simply being able to look at our worship life, are we only singing happy songs? Or are we actually honest about life? Are we, you know... How do we live together? Do we have good quality relationship with one another? And just being honest about who we are and realistic about what we can achieve so that we can move forward together. I think that makes a better place. But making a conscious effort to be welcoming to, uh, well, not just to those who struggle from the outside, but, you know, a third of us would experience something at some point in our life. So any church will have people within it that are struggling with their mental health. And it's about saying, this is who we are. This is part of life with God. This is part of the journey of faith. Let's, let's make that journey together.
The Path of Happiness. More music from the Poor Clares of Arundel from their new CD, My Peace I Give You. It's available to buy as a CD or to download from all the usual websites, with all the royalties going to charity. And my thanks to my special guest today, Reverend Dr. Isabel Hamley, Principal of Ridley Hall Theological Training College. And now we finish, as we usually do, with a look at our notice board and a word from Eddie Floyd of Fireblade Ministries, a Christian outreach that comes to the TT Festival each year, offering a helping hand, a listening ear and the gospel message of God's love. You'll find them in the grounds of St Andrew's United Reformed Church at the St Ninian's Crossroads on Glen Crutchery Road, and they'll be there up to Friday the 7th. And as this is the 30th anniversary of Fireblade Ministries coming to the TT, they've organised a special celebration evening, and it's this Wednesday, June the 5th, at St Joseph's Church on Fenella Avenue in Williston. The celebration starts at 7pm on Wednesday evening, and they'd love to see you there. News now of the TT refreshments that I know about. Bride Church Hall will be open today and tomorrow from noon until 4pm, serving delicious sandwiches and cakes. And it's cash payments only here, please. The TT Cafe in Balaf Village Hall, just a short distance from Balaf Bridge down Station Road, is open now and will be open every day up to and including Friday the 7th from 9am to 4.30pm, serving all-day breakfasts, bacon or sausage baps, burgers, homemade soup, freshly made sandwiches, homemade cakes and hot and cold drinks to eat in or to take out and they're very happy to take card payments. There's a TT Cafe in Selby Methodist Church at the crossroads opposite the Selby Glen Hotel. They'll be serving food on all the race days, starting one hour before the roads close. Sausage and bacon baps, lunchtime specials including chilli, lasagna, curry or cottage pie, homemade desserts and cakes and hot drinks. And the annual Mad Sunday barbecue in the grounds of Selby Methodist Church will start serving later this morning at half past 11 with a warm welcome for everyone. Tomorrow, June the 3rd, there'll be Mad Monday TTTs in Dolby Schoolrooms with motorcycle memorabilia for sale. Dolby Schoolrooms will be open tomorrow from 9am, serving bacon baps, cakes, coffee, soup and sandwiches and afternoon teas throughout the day until 4pm. No need to book, come and sit in the garden in the sunshine and enjoy home-baked food and all the skeet. Everyone's really welcome and proceeds will support Dolby Church Restoration Fund and their chosen charities for this year. And finally, the Abbey Church Hall in Balasala is open twice this week serving brunch. That'll be on Tuesday the 4th and Thursday the 6th this week from 9am to 2.30pm. And I'm afraid that's all that we have time for now. But I'll be back later in our virtual lounge tonight from nine o'clock onwards. Virtual comfy chairs, hot drinks and snacks. Virtually everything you need to round off your day. But the easy listening music and your requests and dedications are very real. And I'd love you to join me if you can. So, until whenever we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for listening. And I wish you and those you love a blessed and safe week and a very good morning.